Let us open our Bibles on John chapter 3. Let us come before the Lord in reading this blessed passage. We are on John chapter 3. We shall go today from verse 22 until verse 36. Now, I will not preach all these verses. I believe it shall take me two sermons. Today I will go until verse 30, I hope, I hope, I, it really should be possible to go until verse 30, but it will be a, two, a sermon in two parts, today will be part number one. Next Sunday, next Lord's Day, we shall be able, we should be able to go until the end of the chapter. We shall read from verse 22 until verse 36 at the present moment, because it's one unit, it's one pericopi, it's one... Uh, one textual unit, so it is important that we we have the whole context in mind, okay? After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon, near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can re can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So far the reading of the word of our Lord. Let me ask you guys a question. Are you the jealous type? Are you the kind of person that, if you ever hear a comparison, doesn't matter who is being compared to whom, you always put yourself on that comparison. You know, you know when you are in a in a circle of people and that is that one person that they want to make everything about themselves. They always want to tell their stories. They, so some people, they have this... Let me start again. I think this is true to everybody. Some people less, some people more. So let me continue. You know that kind of person that they want to make everything about themselves. They always want to be the center of attention. Once again, I think this is true for everybody. I think everybody want to be the center of attention. I think we all do. We all do. Doesn't mean that we all want to be the topic in discussion. That doesn't mean that everybody wants that. Some people are terrified of that. Some people, they rather punch a knife than be the, the, the topic of conversation in a group of friends. However, to varying degrees, everybody want to be the center of attention. Everybody wants to be. When the Bible says that we should love our neighbor 
like we love ourselves. The Bible meant, as far as I can interpret it, that we are always loving ourselves. And because of that, the Bible tells us, well, love others as well. Not that the Bible is condemning caring for ourselves. No, Paul actually told that to Timothy, care for yourself and for the doctrine. Of course. However, sometimes we things can go overboard. Some people, they, they take that biblical commandment to love neighbor as oneself and say, you see, the Bible is telling you love others. But the Bible is also telling you love yourself. That's not the point there. The point there, the Bible is assuming that we already have this problem. We love ourselves way too much. And the Bible is trying to take the attention, the focus away from us and, cause, and, and telling us to love others as well. So the problem is not that sometimes we only love others and not ourselves, or some, some, another time we love only ourselves and not others. That's not the, the Bible is not putting this on equality. The Bible is actually saying, you always love yourself. You, you love yourself way too much. So here's the biblical remedy. Love others. And now on this text here, we... We have a, that situation appearing. Another question for you. Is it easy for you? Does it come naturally to you? To rejoice at other people's good fortune? I remember when I was a, a just not even a teenager. It was before. It was actually on childhood. I had a friend that actually told me once. When, whenever that guy, whenever I hear that that guy wants to have something inside my heart, I'm going to wish that he doesn't have it. I, I, that actually came out of a, of a friend's mouth once. I, it, it was shocking for me. And this other friend that he was referring to, one day told me, Felipe, Whatever I tell you, don't tell that other dude. Because sometimes I think that I'm not able to achieve things because that guy wishes bad on me. I mean, su totally superstitious, of course, totally. But I heard those statements. And one day he actually came to me and said, see, I didn't tell anybody that I wanted to do something. And I actually was able to achieve one of the very few things in my life. I mean, there's this 12 years old boy speaking, okay? <laughs> Maybe I'll ever. Whatever I achieved in my life, I achieved without telling others. Since childhood, these problems plague us. Here's the sad truth about humanity. Fallen humanity. Rejoicing for others' good fortune. Rejoicing, rejoicing with those that rejoice. It is not something that comes naturally to everybody. In fact, have you noticed, have you found yourself when upon hearing somebody's good news from somebody, let's say he was promoted at work or he his marriage is doing so well that they are they went to, they went to celebrate and they had a very nice fancy trip to Spain for three weeks and they went to very nice places and went to very nice beaches and, they, and touristic attraction. They saw a lot of touristic attractions and their marriage is doing so well. Have you ever found yourself thinking, well, I'm not that well. Instead of thinking, wow, that's so nice that they are doing well. Your first thought was, I wish I was like that. I were like that as well. Or, yeah, good for them. Not for me. Have you, have you found yourself in those situations? We see that on today's text. Now, however, let me be honest here. The center, the heart of the text here, it is not, don't be jealous. That's not the heart of the, of the passage. 
That is a big deal in this passage, and that's why I'm speaking about it at length. But the heart of this passage here, the, cent the central aspect of this passage here is Jesus. And let me tell you how. If you go, still in this chapter, in chapter 3, from verse 1 until verse 21, we were observing a conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And we saw what Nicodemus thought of Christ, the opinion that Nicodemus had of Christ. Oh, Jesus, you are a teacher from God. We saw Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, embarrassed, maybe afraid. You see, Nicodemus could lose his job. He was a big deal. Nicodemus was one of the chief of the Pharisees. He was one of the head of the Pharisees. He was a big deal in Phariseeism at the time. He was a big deal in Judaism at the time. He was a very, he held a very high position. One of the heads of Judaism was Nicodemus at that time. Well, he was embarrassed. He was afraid of losing his position. His opinion of Jesus was that, well, Jesus, I know, I know, so far I know that you are a good guy. Like, you are one of the good guys. I mean, really, you, you, in fact, I know you come from God. Let me be, let me take it easy with Nicodemus here as well, because we know that he improved phenomenally. He actually became a full believer, a, a real believer eventually. But we're looking at the beginning. You and I begin like this. We begin having a low opinion of Christ. We begin not knowing who Christ is. We begin embarrassed of Christ. That's how the chapter began. And now the chapter is giving us, the chapter just John the Apostle gave us on this section here, one side of the coin. Not the coin. Like, one, one, let, me, let me use a different metaphor. Gave us an example of how one should not think of Jesus, of how, of how sh one should not come to Jesus, of the kind of opinion that one should not hold of Jesus, the kind of um, low estimation of Christ. And now John wants the apostle, wants to show us what is real, what one should really think of Christ, what is the real believer looks like. So John began by showing us a, a, a timid position, a shy position, an embarrassment towards Christ. But now John the apostle is showing us the example of John the Baptist. Now here's the other side. Here's how a believer speaks of Christ. Here's uh, how a believer sees Christ. Here's how a believer rejoices in Christ. That's the heart of the passage. The heart of the passage is not, he must increase and I must decrease. That's a big deal. That's a massive deal here. But this, the main point of this passage is, Jesus is at the heart. The heart of the passage is that Jesus is at the heart of every issue. That's it. If I were to, to, to call this passage, Jesus is everything. Not the passage, forgive me. The, the, if I were to call today's sermon, Jesus is everything, I'll, I'll, that would be okay. I'm calling today's sermon the centrality of Christ. That's what this whole text is all about. That Jesus should be at the center of our ministry, at the center of our joy, at the center of our priorities. Jesus must be at the center of everything. Now, the verse that best, the best captures that is indeed the verse 30. He must increase and I must decrease. Now, let us look at this text in detail. Let us go to verse 22 and 23. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, he was at this moment here, he was in the land of Judea. Remember, Jerusalem is the capital. The region is called Judea. Above Judea, we have Samaria. And above Samaria, we have Galilee. In Galilee, that's where Jesus grew up. Capernaum is, we can call his headquarters in the north. But John, John the Baptist, was in the region of Judea. He was in the south. John, that's where John the Baptist 
began his ministry. That's where his ministry exploded. That's where he had great success in ministry. But look at what happened here. Jesus, which was operating mostly in the north, I mean, if you go back a few pages, we're going to see on the beginning of chapter 2, the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. That was his first miracle. So he was all the way up. John the Baptist in the south. Here's what happened. Jesus came to Judea. Now, look at verse 23. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem. Well, it's difficult for us to say exactly for sure where this is today. But if you, whether you're talking about Anon or Salim, Salim is may, maybe a bit easier to say. It's in the north. Anon, all the estimations that people make for the location of this place is also in the north. So what we can say is that Judea is in the south. John began his ministry there, but John is also no longer in the north, in the south. Look at this. Now, John also was baptized in Enon near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. Jesus came to Judea. And John the Baptist, what did he do? Well, if Jesus is working here, I'll let Jesus be. I'll let Jesus be. Take the, the front seat here. Oh, hell, let Jesus take the spotlight. I'm going to remove myself from my location, from where I began my ministry. And I'm going to go to the north. Isn't that amazing? Now, I can imagine the, follow, the following thought crossing John's head. Maybe John coming to Jesus, huh? And John tells Jesus, Hey, cousin, my dear, love, beloved cousin Jesus, I know you're the Christ. I know you're the prophet. I know the whole world hinges on you. But he, here's my situation. I have, I have a situation that I need to discuss with you. I also have a ministry. God also sent me to, to preach, to baptize, to prepare the way for you. But I began my work here in, the, in Judea. And you began your work in the north. Well, can, can't we stay like this? Like, you stay there, I stay here? So that we are not taking people from each other so that there's no problem, you know? Maybe John could have said that. Now, here's the thing. That conversation happened only on my head. John never did this. John saw that Jesus came to the south. And what did John do? That's okay. Jesus is here. Let Jesus be wherever he wants. I will go to the north so that I do not take, so that I do not take the spotlight from him. He is the Messiah. I am not. Let him have the spotlight. If he's here, I'm going to go to another region. If he goes to another region, let him do it. Let him do whatever he wants. I will move myself I'll remove myself to another location. You see the, the heart, the, the humble heart of this man? How this man, even before his disciples said anything, this man wanted Jesus to be at the center. Now, we continue here. Um, John was also baptizing there. People come to him, they baptized. Verse 22. Jesus was with his disciples. He remained with them and baptized. Now, we know by we know that Jesus himself actually was not baptizing. If you go to chapter 4, on the same, on my Bible, it's on the same page. Look at this. Uh, chapter 4, verse 2. Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. So, Jesus himself did not baptize anybody. Why? Well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? Uh, imagine if somebody comes, person A comes to person B and asks, uh, who have you been baptized? Who baptized you? Oh, I was baptized by that 
that pastor there. Oh, I was baptized by Jesus. Oh. All of a sudden, that guy would feel superior to everybody else. Now, Paul himself had this situation. Look at this. Let me read to you guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14, all the way to 17. This is Paul speaking to the church in Cor at Corinth. I thank God that I baptized none of you. Think about that. See, the church in Corinth, they were having, it was, a, it was a split church. It was a church with several factions inside the church. Some people were saying, oh, I am, I belong to Paul. Oh, I belong to Apollo. Oh, I belong to this guy. Oh, I belong to that guy. And there were those guys. Oh, that, that's my favorite. Those are my favorites. They, they thought of themselves so highly that they said, no, we belong to Jesus. It was a church that people could not agree on a thing. It was a church that if you, if you counted the heads, you would count how many different opinions they had. A church that was split. A church that was divided against herself. And Paul writes to them, I'm so happy I did not baptize anybody there. Why? None of you, except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Paul is saying, guys, I, I'm happy I didn't baptize any of you guys. Because if you guys, if I had baptized many of you, you guys would say, no, we are better than the other dudes. The other dudes are baptized by whoever. We, we were baptized by, by Paul. We were baptized by the apostle. We are better guys than those guys. We are a superior kind of Christianity. We, we, we breathe the air from higher mountains. It reminds me of the book of a man that I really don't like his writings. I, 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 Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. In one of his books, he actually wrote, those who understand my writings, those who are worthy of my writings, they are the kind of people that breathe higher air. I'm not joking, he actually wrote that. No wonder that Adolf Hitler loved reading that guy. So that, that's why Jesus was not baptizing anybody. He didn't want people to think, think of themselves higher than they should think of themselves. And now still in verse 23, you see here that there was much water there. Some people may come to this text and say, see, baptism should be by immersion. Otherwise, doesn't make sense, this text. You don't need, you can, half a glass of water is enough to baptize a multitude with sprinkling, which is true. And see, we this proves that the proper way of baptizing somebody is by immersion. You put the whole person down under the water. <clears throat> and my answer to that is, no, no, that doesn't really prove that. That doesn't really prove that. Here's one thing. The rivers in the promised land are not the rivers that we find in Brazil. Huge rivers. Plenty of water. Rivers that you cannot see the other side. Some parts of the Amazon River are like that. The promised land. I remember my mom was visiting visited Israel recently. And she came home and she told me about the Jordan River. And she really laughed when she told me about the Jordan River. She said, when you, she told me, Philip, when you read in the Bible, I mean, the Jordan River, the very famous river in Israel, one of the most well-known rivers in the world. And you get that, it's so disappointing. The river is like this big. It's such a tiny river. It's, in Brazil, we would call that like a, a creek. Maybe not even that much. So it is convenient. if Even if you're baptizing by sprinkling 
it would still be convenient to be, especially at that time, it would still be convenient to be on a river, putting, grabbing a little bit of water from the river and pouring the water on the person's head. Let me remind you, that is also the desert. This place is hot, okay? So that's not an argument that proves that the right way to baptize people is by immersion. But I want to make a note on baptism. What are the proper ways of baptizing somebody? There are three ways that the Church of Christ has been have been practicing for millennia. Immersion, you completely submerge the person under water. A fusion, I think it's called, yeah, a fusion where you pour a whole lot of water on the person's head and a sprinkling, which is really, you pretty much make your hands wet and drop a little bit of water on the person's head. Which one is right, which ones, which ones or which one is right or are right or which one or which ones is or are wrong? And the answer is, they are all acceptable. They are all acceptable. Now, the church that I belong to, we have the practice of being baptizing people by sprinkling. We have our reasons for that. I am ready to defend that theologically. Please notice that the Old Testament talks about sprinkling over and over and over. And when the Bible talks about baptism and make, making in one passage where the Bible talks about baptism, they refer to the baptism that took place when they crossed the Red Sea. Now, the people that were baptized by sprinkling there made it across. The people that were baptized by immersion there, they died. So, you know, but notice one thing. All forms of baptism, the Bible doesn't have a specific instructions, thou shalt baptize on this way, that way, or the other way. It's not the amount of water that will make a difference. See, I can pour an entire river on your head and it will be no more, no less special or powerful or blah, 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 at all. It doesn't matter if it takes a glass, a bucket, or, a, or an entire swimming pool. It doesn't matter. The amount of water is not at issue here. What matters in baptism, if, it, if we're baptizing an adult, is if the person believes that or not, if the person has received Christ or not. On the case of the baptism of children, what matters is if the parents are making a true confession of their faith and a true promise that they will cause that child to grow learning the gospel, that they'll teach the child the gospel as soon as the child can comprehend words, can understand words. So that's just a side note on, on baptism that I thought would be important here. Now, another matter, on still on baptism, this is not the baptism that we see on the New Testament as a sacrament. That theology had not been developed by then. This was a practice that, they were in, that John the Baptist was employing, having a reference, the Old Testament, and the many... Um, rituals of purification found in the Old Testament by sprinkling, may I add. That is, we don't find rituals in the Old Testament telling the people of God to purify objects or persons by submerging anyone or anything into anything at all. But once again, this is just to say that there is no problem. If you are baptized by this form of baptism, that's okay. You don't need to seek another form of baptism. I have friends that have been baptized by sprinkling, and then they said, oh, I I, I, I don't think that was good. I, I wanted to pass through the waters. They are, they're even poetic. I, I want to go through the waters of the waters, plural, the waters of baptism. Boy, have mercy. So we continue. Verse 24. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, it looks like, at first glance, that the author of this gospel, the Apostle John, was just giving the game away on the beginning. Oh, he, he just died, but no. 
The death of John was a very well-known event at the time. This gospel was written multiple decades by, by John, and it was written a lot after a lot of time had passed after John the Baptist had been thrown into prison and died. Okay. <clears throat> John and Jesus had the, the ministry kind of overlapped about six months, maybe less. So that's why. We, we, are fi we find ourselves on this situation. Look at this, verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Their ministry was taking place for a while at the same location. Once again, Jesus came to Judea and John eventually left. Now, we see, like I said, he was thrown in prison. It was a very well-known event. His death became actually was actually registered in the Gospels. I'll, I'll read to you guys quickly how this man died. It's going to be important for us to understand this. You can read on Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 until verse 12. It, it's a longer section. It's 12 verses. Let me simply tell you what happened. Herod, so-called Herod the Great at the time, was having sexual relations with Herodias, Herodias, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name in English. I think Herodias. Herodias was the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. And Herod took her. John the Baptist rebuked him over and over and told him, you are sinning against the Lord. You are going against the command of God. It is not allowed for you. It is not licit for you. It is not fair that you do this. You took somebody else's wife and made her your own. And you are having relations with her. Shame on you for breaking the commandments of God. And he rebuked him publicly. Herod got very angry. Put that man in jail. But he never killed him because... He actually had some form of some form of admiration for him. And there was also the people that he feared what the people would do if he did that. Came a big event, it was his birthday, a good excuse for debauchery. And uh, they had this big party, people drinking. This girl was dancing most for sure, a very sensual kind of dance. And um, this was the daughter of Herodias the wife of the former wife of his brother and this little this girl pleased herod and herod told her ask me whatever you want, whatever you want at that time it was even common for kings to say you can ask me even half of my kingdom and i'll give you it was just a, a kind of a, a hyperbolic offer nobody if somebody would say okay okay good deal give me half of your kingdom you wouldn't be given was just a, it was understood that it was just a form of sounding gentle, polite, kind, feeling generous. And um, the mother called the daughter and said, go and ask him for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Ask right here, bring me his head. You know, like bring somebody's head on a silver platter. That, that, that's it. That's right here. He was embarrassed. He didn't want to do that. But because he didn't want to be put to shame in front of all his guests, he gave in. He gave in. John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Testament. John the Baptist in Jesus' own words, okay, in Jesus' own words, there is no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. Big deal. That, that's a praise. If I ever seen one, that's it. That's a proper praise coming from Jesus' lips about another him about a regular human being. That's high praise. As high as it gets, in my understanding. And how did that man's life end? At the whims of a jealous woman. A woman that didn't want to be rebuked. A shameless woman. A woman that wanted to continue her, her life of sexual immorality. 
and Herod. Herod gave in. Herod thought that it was better to give in, better to to appear nice in front of his guests. He brought the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Wow. Wow. That's all it took. That's all it took. A great man of God, a great man of God died just like that. All it took was two women and a weak man to end the life of the last prophet of the Old Testament. Let me read to you a passage that is today's today's word would do well in remembering this proverbs chapter 31 the words of king lemuel the utterance which his mother taught him so this is what the mother of a king is teaching a king Look at this. This came from the mother. Verse 2 and 3. What, my son? And what, son of my womb? And what, son of my vows? So what, meaning? Like, what should I say to you? What should I? My son, what is that one thing that I cannot forget to teach you? Verse 3. Do not give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Here's the point that this woman is trying to make. This is a mother teaching a son. Teaching very well. Very well. Very, very, very well. This is what this mother is saying. My son, do not give in to sexual pleasure. Do not let sexual pleasure rule your life that's why he's specifically saying women if the point of the mother was don't let other people control you it wouldn't make sense to specify women the sexual component here is important that's why this mother is saying my son don't let your sexual appetite control your life don't give in don't become a weak man for the sake of pursuing sexual pleasures that's what she's saying don't let women control you just because those women are willing to sleep with you that's more of a plain english version here to now that's what he's saying if herod would have followed this argument here if Herod would have considered the words of King of the mother of King Lemuel, John the Baptist's head, his life would not have ended just because a good-looking girl danced and a jealous woman whispered on the heads of sad good-looking girl. That's it. Isn't that ridiculous? Doesn't that sound horrible sounds like this uh, like a dystopian situation a dystopic situation i don't know if forgive me i don't even know if that's a proper word for it it sounds bizarre why did the life of the last prophet of the old testament end ended why did his life why did his life end because one guy wanted to have sex so much that he gave in to another to the advice of a woman and he killed the other guy you see how john's life ended but this is a great man john was a great man at that time see he were not being thrown he had not been thrown in prison at that time and his ministry was very very successful his ministry. I'm making all this big deal about John's 
how he ended his life. Because later on in the sermon, this will be quite important, okay? Please bear with me. So it was such a big deal that his disciples, and his disciples, that his disciples loved him so much. And his disciples were kind of protective of him. They were so loyal to him, loyal to a fault, literally. To a fault in this case. And they started having a, a problem. They were feeling jealous. They come, Master, Master John. Look at look at how they spoke. On verse twenty six. He who was with you beyond the Jordan, why not say Jesus? Why not say the Christ? Why not say the Messiah? They could not even pronounce his name. They were so jealous. Behold, he is baptizing. Why not say the Messiah, God on the flesh? The blessed second person of the Trinity. Why not say he whom we have always waited? The glory, the glorious man that God sent. Why not say that? Or why not call him by his name, Jesus? Or say Emmanuel? Why, why not? They could not. They're so jealous. But I, I understand their mind. They, they were protective of their master. Okay, okay, fair enough. But they shouldn't have been like this. It, they could have been protective, but at the same time understand. Wait a minute. That is the that is the guy that our master told us about. That is the guy that is not just a regular guy. That is God. That is the, the Messiah of God. Not just a guy. That is that is the weighted man, the man that we've been all, always waiting for for thousands of years. That is the man, the seed of the woman. The one that was to come. They should have thought of Jesus like that. And they heard. They heard John teaching and speaking of him so many times. Uh, they said, oh, look at this, look at this. To who, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified. Look at this. They're saying, John, uh, Master John, uh, the, the, the person that you told us about, that you told us a million times about him, he is, and then they went and had, they were jealous. See, they, they, their lips betrayed their attitude. Their lips showed that their attitude was not right. See, they loved his master. But you see, they had a very great affection. They had a great massive affection for their master. They did not pay attention to his teachings that much. If they had paid attention well, they would have understood that there is, it's impossible to actually be jealous of someone that you want him to be everything. It's impossible. If I want A to be exalted, how can I be actually be jealous of A? I, if I want him to be exalted, it's a it's a it's a illogical it's a contradictory thing you cannot have both ways like or you chew or you whistle or it's either either or let me pause here sometimes you and I can be like this we may have affections and I don't mean romantic they they can they may or may not be romantic it, don't think only on that aspect now Affections for your dad or your mother or, or a friend or a spouse. You can have affections for somebody that are quite profound. But you actually miss what you should have learned with that person. Let me say this. Many Christians are like that. They may like their pastor's teaching. They like, they have a very... A, uh, they, they appreciate their pastor so much. They tell the pastor, oh, we like you. You are such a great guy. Blah, 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 blah. Write him notes sometimes. Look what you're doing in my life. What, your ministry has been such a blessing for me. And all that, which is all nice and fine. And which encourages many, many, many pastors. And let me tell you, if, if one thing that pastors need 
that I can say for sure that they don't get enough is encouragement. Many pastors feel not encouraged, many. So many people may say that and all of this and miss what their pastors are teaching them. This is what was happening here. They loved John, but they missed what John said. And their very words taught us that the problem was not that they did not hear with the physical ear or that they had a brain situation that caused them to not think, not to not remember, that they had a weak memory. No, their recollection was spot on. You know, the guy, the guy that you just, that you spoke about, uh, the one that wants to come, yeah, the, he, 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 he is there baptizing. So their memory was perfect. Their problem is that they were putting their allegiance on John to the detriment of Christ himself. You and I do that sometimes. We may, we may go along with our tribe or our group or our I, the, the, the people that we kind of think that give us a sort a sense of identity we may go along with them more easily than we go along with Christ wives may be inclined to listen to the husband instead of listening to Jesus husbands may be inclined to listen to the wife more than they listen to Jesus Many times that happens. Many times. Many times. Children may be, not children, let me start again. People are often more inclined to listen to their peers more than they listen to God himself. People may be more inclined to hear, to pay attention to their book, to the regular books that they buy instead of Treasuring, above all, the teaching of the scripture. That's what we have here. And then John replied them. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Here's what John is saying. Guys, a lot of people are coming to Jesus. Let me tell you who is sending all those people to Jesus. Heaven. God. So let me, here's what John is saying. Guys, let me get this straight. Wait a minute. You guys are concerned that God is giving all those people to Jesus. Did I get it right? Is that your concern? That's what he's saying here. John is saying, guys, don't you know the doctrine of the sovereignty of God? Don't you know? Have you guys been with me for so long and you guys did not hear me teaching the doctrine of the sovereignty of the Almighty? Didn't I ever teach you guys the doctrine of the control that God exerts on history? Don't you know that God can move the hearts of men? Don't you know that the heart of men, even the heart of the king, I think that's a proverb, that the heart of the king is in the hand of God and God can incline it to the left or to the right? If the heart of the king is in the hand of God, what do you think about the heart of the regular people? John is saying, are you guys jealous that God himself is gifting, gifting these people to his own son? Are you guys jealous that the father is giving a son gifts? Now, as I explain this, these disciples of John sound very immature, don't they? That's you and I. Very immature. That's you and I. That's sin. Sin is like this. See, let me tell one thing. 
I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the disciples of John, when they brought the matter to John, they thought it was a big deal. John, this is not fair, John. John, come on, man. Have some self-respect. John, you began your ministry here in Judea, John. John, you are famous here. John, you are a big deal. Jesus arrived later. Jesus arrived six months after you. No, forgive me, not six months, forgive me. They overlapped. Jesus arrived many years after you. John, you were already a big deal. When you, John, who baptized? Did Jesus baptize you or you baptized Jesus, John? See, you baptized Jesus. John, 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 John really, John. See, that's how his disciples thought. But it's all sin. It's all, all nonsense. It's all a lack of understanding that God was showing mercy, that God was saving people. But John understood this very well. John understood this very well. I'm not going to go. I said I, I wanted to get to verse 30 today. But from verse 28 until verse 30, there's so much. In fact, I'm right in the middle of the sermon that I'm not, I'm not going to go and if into that let me hold my horses for now let, let me go on until here but John is, John is telling them guys God is being kind God is saving people who, who do you think guys why did I come don't you didn't you guys read the Old Testament Voice that cry in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. So I am that voice. I have been preparing the way of the Lord. And now that the Lord actually arrived, you want me to be upset that the Lord is famous or more famous than I am? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? That's you and I. We call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ. That's what a Christian means. One that is like a small Christ, one that wants to be like Christ, one that follows after Christ, one that is a disciple of Christ. That's what Christian means. We call ourselves Christians, but we don't want to be a follower of Christ. We want Christ to be a follower of, 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 of us. You, you, you see that? It's, we invert the position. I know somebody that did that. His name is Lucifer. God made the throne God made everything. God made that angel and made him extremely good looking. A light, an angel of light. Taking care of the choirs of heaven. Wow, what a, what a man. An archangel. Whoosh. And then he said, I'm going to sit in the throne of the Almighty. You see, he, he wanted to reverse the positions. God, I think I am a bigger deal than you are. That's what, that's the mentality in the heads of the disciples of John. John, you are a bigger deal than Jesus is, John. That's sometimes you and I. We tell ourselves, oh, I'm a Christian, Christian, Jesus, 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 blah, 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 blah. But I... And then we think that we deserve, we think that we are big deal. We think that we are hot stuff. We think that we are great. And John is saying, no, no. I, the Old Testament spoke of this. A voice in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I am only the voice. He is the Lord. How can a voice be greater than the, the Lord? And this voice that cries out, that's a reference to 
the heralds. The heralds, the heralds were the announcers, the official announcers, the guys that had a very nice, powerful, blasting voice that would shout announcements. That was an official position. Their only job was to announce events or the arrival of dignitaries. A big deal is arriving. The herald comes and say, uh, Beh Behold, the king of, I don't know, Jamaica is coming to visit us. Be ready for the king. And that, that kind of stuff, you know. That's the herald's job. Just a voice. So the Old Testament spoke of John. Herald. Voice in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. See, now imagine how bizarre a herald coming and announcing the arrival of, let's say, the king of Jamaica. I don't know if Jamaica has a king. I don't know what. I don't think Jamaica has a Let's say Spain. Spain has a king. Behold, the king of Spain. And then the king of Spain enter, enters. And then... As the king of Spain is going to speak, the herald comes and goes again. You know, I want to tell you guys, behold, the king of Spain. And the king of Spain looked like, okay. And then the king of Spain want to speak. And then the herald goes, you know, guys, I want to say more. And then the herald, the herald, the announcer becomes the center of attention and not the king that he announced. Can you imagine how bizarre? How, how that, 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 you see, that can make, that can make the audience angry. Like if I'll be on that audience, I'll feel like saying, dude, zip it. The king is here. You sh zip it. That's us. Instead of talking about Christ and let Christ take the spotlight, we are the heralds that believe themselves to be bigger than the king of Spain. We are the voice that prepares the way of the Lord. And we think that the people should not be rejoicing with the Lord, but should be rejoicing with the voice we are the people that think that the mouth is greater than the king. We are the people that think that we should be in the center. That's you and I. That's you and I. Make no mistake. And if you're telling yourself, Felipe, I don't think I am like that, then the problem is even worse than I imagined. Then, it's, then you're really like that. Do you know why? Because we are like that. And those who deny it, they are like that even more. Even more. We love. I, I, I heard one of my teachers once talk about this study, this research, anthropological research, and uh, they came to this conclusion that the most, the favorite topic of people is themselves. <laughs> That's a scientific research. You and I can spend hours and hours and days and weeks and months talking about ourselves and will not be bored and will not be bored. Some churches are like this. The pastor want to take the, the leadership. Everything about them, about the church, has to do with the figure of that pastor. It's all about the pastor. All about the pastor. Some ministries, they're all about this guy or that guy. Do you think like that? Do you think that your church is all about you? Because you gave that amount of money. 
or because you come to church early or because you are the nicest guy or gal at your church or because you have been on your church for a long time so your opinion is more important than the opinion of the other guys that have been on church for less time than you do you think that now it's a Christian church it should be all about Christ it's not a minister church it's not a, an elder's church. It's not a deacon's church. It's not the guy who gives the most amount of money church. It's not the church of the good-looking fella, the church of the nice fella, the church of the fella, of the old fella. No, it's the church of Christ. It's the church of Christ. Do you love the church of Christ? Do you love Christ? Let's end the sermon with this. Are you jealous? Are you jealous? Do you? Do you think that your church should be more about you sometimes? Let me remind you. Let, let me tell you how the level of interest that God has in putting you in the center. Let me tell you. The old the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, the last prophet, forgive me, the last prophet of the Old Testament died a trivial death on a trivial party for a trivial reason. God himself had said, that's the best among mankind. We can debate the meaning of that statement at another time, but for now, let's stick with the actual statement. It's the best guy. Among those born of women, best one here, that dude there. How much of a big deal do you think God wants to make of you? I, one statement that was a great, great, great blessing for me was a story that I heard of this man. I, honestly, I even forgot who the guy was. I remember the story. I remember the miracle, but I don't remember the saint. <laughs> I remember the story, but I don't remember the author. Not the, 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 the main character. It was a, a famous man in Christian history. I read, be kind to me, I read the book like almost 20 years ago. This was in the Middle Ages and this man was praying and praying and asking God, God, wh what are you going to do with me? And then um, as he was praying, he looked up and he saw a dog tearing up a piece of cloth. And this was not in a nice home with a nice garden. No, this was an in in ugly looking scenario and um, there was mud. And the dog was on the mud and putting the cloth on the mud and was, you know, the dog was stepping on the on the cloth and, and biting and tearing the cloth apart. And he said at that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to him the following. I'm going to make to your reputation what that dog is doing to that cloth. And after I do that, I'm going to use you. It's difficult for, it's difficult to use hands that are already full. It's very difficult. I get annoyed with my children when I tell them to clean up the living room and they have one toy here and they use only the other the other hand to clean up the living room. They do a half half of a job. They they don't work properly if when they do that. If your hands are so full of yourself, if you are so full of yourself, how is God going to use you in His kingdom? You're full of yourself. If I'm full of myself, how is God going to use me for His glory? 
I hope that God, based on his majesty, on his wisdom, and on his great intelligence, you do to a certain ex to a certain level what he did to that man. May may our reputation be of less concern, of a of a of no concern to ourselves, and may the glory of Christ be all we think about. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, Almighty God. For you are good and kind and compassionate. You are above, above all, you are God above all gods. And Lord, we are not compassionate, we are not above anything. Lord, in fact, we are quite below. Lord, let us appreciate you more. Lord, let us look at you as the only source of joy. Lord, may you be the number one, number two, and number three favorite topic of our conversation. Lord, may you, may you be the number one, number two, and number three desire of our hearts. Oh Lord, may you are true. You are truth in person and every man is a liar. Lord, make us more like Jesus. Make us more like Jesus. And on his blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen.